This question appeared on a video about using VBA to execute a SQL Server store procedure and pass values to the parameters of that procedure. What the user wanted to do was essentially what the video describes, but with one extra little twist. They want to be able to pass in Unicode text, such as Japanese characters, into the parameters of the procedure. Now, I found this question interesting for a couple of reasons. One, because I'm trying to learn some Japanese myself at the moment. I should just warn you I haven't gotten very far with that, though. So I hope you're not here to learn any Japanese from me. I'm going to focus on the bits that I do know quite well, the VBA and the SQL side of things. And the other reason it was interesting is just because of how much background information there is to know about what Unicode is, why it exists, and how different software treats Unicode text. You can probably tell by the sheer number of tabs I have open here how much background reading there is. I will try to keep the information in the video limited to what you need to know to get this to work, but I'll share some links with you as we go along so you can do some background reading in your own time if you're interested, but that's very much optional. Before we start writing any code, it will be helpful to have a convenient way to enter some Japanese characters. So what I've done is installed the Japanese language pack for Windows so that I can type in some Japanese characters using an English language keyboard. If you would like to do the same thing, you can find your current language in the system tray, wherever your system tray is sitting, mine's in the bottom right hand corner of my screen. And if you click on the current language, you can choose language preferences. If that option isn't available, you can also right click on your start menu and choose settings and then head to the time and language option, find the language setting on the left hand side and then find your list of installed languages in this list here. To add Japanese, you can click the plus button, find Japanese in the list and then follow the steps by clicking the next button to get that installed. I found that I had to restart my machine after doing that to get everything to work properly, but once you've done all that, you should find that in the language bar you now have access to both English and Japanese using something called the Microsoft IME, or Input Method Editor. To test that we can type in some Japanese characters, I've opened a fresh copy of Notepad and I'm going to start in here by typing in some column headings. So I'll begin with English. Uh, so in that column, I'll type in some basic English phrases and words. I do know at least a few of those. Uh, then I'll hit the tab key a few times to get a bit of space. And the next column heading will be the word Romaji. Romaji are like the English language spellings of Japanese words. So they're Japanese words written in Roman characters. And these are quite important when we're using the IME. I'm typing in on a physical English language keyboard. So in order to get the Japanese characters to appear, I need to type in the Roman character equivalents. I'll type in the tab key a few more times to get a bit more space. And the final column heading will be Japanese. OK, our first English phrase, that's going to be the phrase good morning. That seems appropriate for the time of day I'm recording the video. Then I'll hit the tab key to get to the Romaji column. Please forgive the atrocious pronunciation here, but the, uh, the Romaji will be Ohio. In fact, let me uh, type it correctly. First of all, Ohio gozaimasu. As I say, uh, please feel free to either forgive or laugh at the dreadful pronunciation. Uh, to get the Japanese text to appear then, what I need to do is switch my input mode from English to Japanese. And I can do that in a couple of ways. I can physically click on the English language here in the uh, system tray and then choose Japanese. Or there's a keyboard shortcut as well. I can hold down the Windows key and press the space bar to toggle or cycle through the various languages I have installed. So when I switch to Japanese, you'll see that the, uh, the system tray changes its icons. It's showing me the IME language being used or the IME uh, editor being used. And it also shows a capital letter A next door to that. So at the moment, if I start typing into Notepad, if I start typing in Ohio Gozaimas again, it still appears in English language characters. So what I need to do as well is switch into the relevant Japanese script. So I'm going to right click on the capital letter A here. And I can choose between a variety of different Japanese character sets. So the main two here are hiragana and katakana. So hiragana is essentially the Japanese alphabet, which is used to write native Japanese words. Katakana is the Japanese alphabet, which is used to write uh, non-native Japanese words, loan words or foreign words. Uh, for this particular phrase, I'm going to write this in hiragana. So I'll select hiragana and then simply begin typing in the same romaji. So I'll type in the letter O on the keyboard. But hopefully you can see here that it's not the English language O, it's the Japanese hiragana character 
for the sound O. Then I can type in HA, and when I type in HA, that translates into the Japanese character for HA. And then I can continue typing, so YO, and then U. You can hopefully see, much like um, uh, predictive text works, I've got a list of suggestions below. So in fact, the phrase that I want is the first one in the list there. That's the full phrase, Ohio gozaimasu. But I'm going to carry on typing because I kind of like the, uh, the sensation of seeing my, uh, my English language characters get transformed into the Japanese hiragana. So as I say, I'm just typing in exactly what I've typed in, in the Romaji column. But you can see it's translated into the appropriate Japanese text. If you did want to select a suggestion, you can either click on it with the mouse or you can use the arrow keys to scroll through the list and then hit enter to accept that suggestion. Next, I'd like to type in some katakana characters for the next word. So I'm going to switch back to the English language first of all by holding down the Windows key and pressing the space bar to highlight English. And then on the next line, I'll type in the UK or the United Kingdom. Now the romaji for the UK would be i, gi, ri, su. So four separate syllables. I can then tab across into the Japanese column and switch back to Japanese using the IME. So hold down the Windows key and hit the space bar to choose Japanese. Now at the moment, the character set that I've chosen is still set to the hiragana character set. So the symbol displayed here is the hiragana for the sim syllable a. If I right click on that, I can choose either full width katakana or half width katakana. Um, half width katakana are literally the same symbols, just occupying half the width on the screen as a full width katakana. And um, if you're uh, curious about why there are two different sets, I'm going to choose full width katakana first, by the way. And then if you're curious about why there are two different sets, why there's a half width, there's a Wikipedia article here that describes why those exist. Now, they're fairly rarely used, which is why I'm picking the full width katakana. So now I can just once again start typing in the exact same romaji I've typed in. So the letter I on my keyboard is translated into the katakana for i, and then gi becomes the symbol for gi, etc. So I can type in ri and then su, and there's ikirisu written in katakana. Again, I can select suggestions from the list, just as I did with the hiragana suggestions. So I can hit enter to have that typed in. And there's some katakana in my notepad file. For the final example in this basic file, I'd like to write some kanji characters. Now, kanji are slightly different to the two types of characters we've written so far. Both katakana and hiragana are essentially alphabets. Each symbol represents a single syllable, and you use them to spell out words. So there you go, there's hiragana spelt out in hiragana. Kanji, on the other hand, are more like small pictures or logographs to give them their formal name, borrowed from the Chinese writing system, and each little picture or logograph represents a word. So to make those work in our IME editor, what I'm going to do is first of all, switch back to English by pressing Windows and Spacebar. And then on the next line, I'll type in Japan. In the Romaji column, I'll type in Nihon. And then in the Japanese column, I'm going to switch first of all to the IME. Then I'm going to select Hiragana. You'll notice you can't select Kanji. You can't type these in directly. You have to rely on the IME to translate your Hiragana or Katakana into the appropriate Kanji. So I'm going to select Hiragana and then begin typing Ni, which gets translated into the syllable for Ni, and then Hon. And you can see hopefully in the list, I've got some pictures representing different words. And the second one in the list there is the uh, the kanji for Japan or Nihon. Uh, the first one in the list there is for Nihongo, which is the Japanese language, but I'm interested in the country Japan, so I'll select the second one in the list and hit enter to have that typed in. So that looks pretty good. We've successfully typed in some Japanese characters using the IME. I think I'm pretty confident we can use that in our code now as well. I'll just switch back to the English language by pressing Windows and then the spacebar, and I'm back typing in in normal English. The next basic thing we need to understand is how the software treats all the text we've typed in in terms of storing it and displaying it back to us. 
And this is at the point at which it's very easy to fall into a rabbit warren of reading various linked Wikipedia articles about how text is encoded in computing. So allow me to give you a, a short summary of that. A good place to start if you want a human readable version of this information. This article here written by one of the guys responsible for the Stack Overflow website. The bare minimum you need to know about character sets, encodings, Unicode and all that stuff. And even if you do know this, it's a fairly entertaining read, so I'd recommend it. To give you the absolute basics of what you need to know for the software we're using in this video, we've basically got two main character encoding systems we could use. We can use what's known as an ASCII character encoding standard or a Unicode character encoding standard. ASCII is old, older even than I am in fact, and it allows you to store and display up to 95 different characters. And in standard ASCII, this set of 95 displayable characters is always the standard English alphabet in uppercase and lowercase, the numeric digits 0 to 9, and the punctuation characters. On top of standard ASCII, you've got what is commonly known as extended ASCII, although that term isn't liked by everybody, so I'll try not to use it too much. But essentially, this gives you access to an additional 128 characters. But this set of 128 characters isn't fixed. This is determined by the code page that is being used for the encoding. The most common code page you will see used in at least an English language version of Windows is the one called Windows 1252. And if I can just quickly zoom in on this little image here in the top right hand corner, you can see that most of the additional characters there are various accented characters for different European languages. So, um, confusingly, the combination of standard ASCII and extended ASCII using the Windows 1252 code page is commonly known as ANSI encoding or ANSI standard. So you'll see that term used again shortly in Notepad. Now, 95 plus 128 gives us access to 223 different characters. If I were to Google how many kanji there are in total, Hmm, that's well over 50,000. So clearly an ASCII character encoding standard is not sufficient to store and display all of the kanji. So that means we need to think about using a Unicode character encoding standard instead. Unicode, think of Unicode as like one gigantic code page if you want to think of it in those terms. It essentially allows you to define, display, store, reference over 1.1 million different characters in the current standard you'll find all the Japanese kanji in the section labeled CJK, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. All those languages use the same symbols, referred to differently and meaning different things, but they're all the same actual literal symbols. There's also a section for hiragana and one for katakana. And if you just care about what emojis you can use in the current Unicode standard, there's a section for that as well. There are a couple of different types of ways of encoding Unicode code points. I hope I'm using the correct terms here. The two we're going to see in this video are UTF-16 and UTF-8. And these articles provide you with all the technical details of those. I think that's probably sufficient background information to understand what's going on here. And um, as I say, if you want the technical detail, some further reading in your own time is recommended. For now, I'd just like to look at what happens when we use those various encodings to save our basic notepad file. You may have noticed in the bottom right hand corner of the notepad window, it tells you which encoding system is currently being used for the document. So I've got UTF-8, Unicode Transformation Format using 8 bits. That's the most popular type of Unicode encoding for websites. Uh, apparently about 97% of all web pages use this type of encoding. I can choose the encoding used to save my notepad document if I head up to the file menu and choose save as. And I'm going to put this in my VBA Japanese text in stored procedures folder. I'll call this one uh, Kana Kanji UTF-8. And then you can see that I can choose the encoding system from this drop down list here. So there are a few other types available here as well. UTF-8 with BOM, byte order mark. Then there are two different versions of UTF-16. So that's a 16-bit Unicode encoding. 
LE stands for Little Endian and BE stands for Big Endian. Um, now, UTF-16 is quite important in Windows. Historically, uh, UTF-16 is the encoding used in uh, Microsoft Windows systems and was the encoding recommended by Microsoft. But um, they're starting to change their mind a little bit since uh, May 2019. The recommendation now seems to be using UTF-8. And you'll see that how that might affect us in SQL Server shortly. For this example, the only thing that's important really is that I use one of the Unicode encoding standards for my notepad document. Without that, I can't store my Japanese characters. So if I store it with UTF-8, save that document, and then I can close it down, and then I can quickly reopen that, and I see exactly the same text brought back. I'm going to head back to the file menu now and choose Save As, and I'm going to choose the ANSI encoding. Now remember, ANSI is that combination of the standard ASCII character set with the extended ASCII using the 1252 code page. Of course you remember that. How could you possibly have forgotten already? <laughs> so let me just change this to say Kana Kanji ANSI. And you'll see a bit of a problem when I click the Save button here. I get a message saying that this text document contains Unicode information. And if I choose to proceed, I am going to lose that Unicode information because it can't be stored in an anti-encoded text files. If I, I'm going to click OK anyway. I've saved a version that does work already. If I click OK, you will see that all of my Unicode characters now get transformed into question marks. So with all this background information in mind, we'll create a basic database and table in SQL Server to hold a combination of English and Japanese text. I'll close down my notepad file and then just minimize my folder. Then I'll head over to Microsoft SQL Server, which I've already opened and connected to a local instance of SQL Server. I've already got a database I was using to test this code before recording the video, so I'm going to ignore that one just for now. I'm going to right click on the databases folder and choose new database. When the dialog box appears, I'll enter a simple name for my database. I'll call it, let's call it Nihongo, so Japanese language. Um, so there we go. And then I'll click OK. I'm not going to bother filling in any of the detailed options. I'll just click OK to create a very basic new database. The next thing I'd like to do is create a table in that database. So from the database or object explorer window, I can expand the database and then I can right click on the tables folder. Now I know that I can write code to create my table, but it's easier to demonstrate some of the options using the basic table designer. So I'm going to create a new table and then I'm going to type in three column names when the designer finally decides to show itself. There she goes. So the first column name will be English text. I'll attempt to spell my native tongue correctly. So English text. And then the next line will be Romaji text. And then finally, Japanese text. Next, we need to choose a data type for each of our three columns. And the data type we pick is determined by the range of characters we need to store in each column. English and Romaji text need to store only English language characters. Japanese text needs to store the Unicode encoded hiragana, katakana, and kanji. I'm working in SQL Server 2017 here, or version 14, so my choices here are fairly straightforward. If you're working in SQL Server 2019, you have a little more choice and the waters are a little more muddy. I'll explain that as we go along. Um, you've basically got four main character data types to choose for text in SQL Server. They all involve the word char in some way, so C-H-A-R. I'm just going to revert to the Microsoft Docs page just for the moment um, and refer to the char and varchar data types. Um, char and varchar are the non-unicode encoded strings in SQL Server 2017 and earlier. Char represents a fixed length string, varchar is a variable length string. So because all the characters or the length of the strings in my various rows are going to be different, I'm going to use varchar for my English and Romaji text. If I switch back to SQL Server Management Studio, I'll choose Varchar for each of those. You'll also see a number appears in parentheses after the name of the data type. Common misconception is that that refers to the number of characters you can store. Sometimes that is true, but not always. Technically, this number refers to the number of bytes used to store the text. 
So if you're storing characters which only require a single byte to store them, like an ASCII encoded string, then yes, that number does represent the number of characters. But in a, a character system which uses more than one byte per character, the two aren't necessarily the same. The maximum number I can enter here is 8,000. Um, if I want more than 8,000 characters, I've got the option to enter max, which allows me to store up to two gigabytes worth of text per, um, per row in that column. So there's a bit of information about that here in the remarks section on the Microsoft Docs site. Um, and then the bit about the max is up here in the definition of the, uh, the var char data type. So um, I'm going to go back and switch that back to saying varchar 8000. And I think those are the correct types to use for the English and Romaji text. For the Japanese text column, I want to allow a Unicode encoded variable length string. And because I'm working in SQL Server 2017, I really only have one choice here, so it's fairly easy. If you're working in SQL Server 2019, however, you have a few more choices. I'm just going to refer back to the Microsoft Docs site for the char and var char data types. Um, it is now possible if you use one of the correct collations, and I'm going to talk about collation shortly, you can now store a UTF-8 encoded Unicode string in a var char or a char column. UTF-8 was one of the Unicode transformation format encoding standards we looked at earlier on when we were saving our, our text in Notepad. Because I'm working in SQL Server 2017, what I need to do is use the nchar or n varchar types to allow the Unicode encoded string. And that's specifically the UTF-16 character encoding system that's being used. I also need to make sure a little later on, again, talking about collations, if I want to store the full range of Unicode characters, 1.1 million of them, I need to ensure that I en uh, enable the supplementary character collation. So I'll do that shortly. I'm going to choose nvarchar for my column. And again, I'll get to pick a number which indicates the maximum length of the column. This time the number indicates the length in byte pairs, not just in bytes. So the maximum number I can enter is 4000. But again, I can use max to allow up to two gigabytes worth of text. For simplicity, I'm going to say that the Japanese text is n varchar and then just put in the maximum number allowed, which is 4000. And that sets the data types for those columns. The final thing I'll do with the Japanese text column is set some of its collation properties. Now collations allow you to specify multiple things about a string column, such as how it's sorted, whether it's case sensitive or not. And you can read all about these properties in the fairly long and wordy article about collation and Unicode support on the Microsoft Docs site. Uh, recommended further reading for you. I'm not going to go through all that now. Just for the basics of what I'm doing in this video, I'm going to select the Japanese text column. And then in the column properties area at the bottom of the screen, find the collation property and then click the dot 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 button at the right hand side, the ellipsis, to open up a dialog box to set these properties. I'll start by changing the collation I'm using from Latin one general to one of the Japanese and, uh, collations. I have to admit, I don't know the technical details between all of these different types. I do know that for one of the things I'm about to do here, I need to choose at least Japanese 90 as the collation type. If I don't choose at least Japanese 90, then I can't enable the supplementary characters option. And if you remember, I'll check that box. Supplementary characters is to do with the nchar or nvarchar data type, which allows the full range of Unicode character data to be stored. So having checked that, I've got a couple of other options I should check as well. There's a checkbox for Kana sensitive, so should it distinguish between katakana and hiragana? I think it should. So I'm going to check the box so that this column will treat katakana and hiragana separately or differently. Width sensitive would distinguish between full width and half width characters. In this example, I'm not going to store any half width characters, so I'm not going to bother with that option. And then, of course, you've got the standard case sensitive and accent sensitive options here as well. But neither of those are relevant for what I'm doing in this video. So I'll leave those as they are. So at this point, I can click OK. And that sets my uh, my collation setting for that column. You can see it's encoded case insensitive, accent sensitive, canna sensitive and supplementary characters. 
So at this point, all I'm going to do is save this table, and I'm going to do that by clicking the Save button up at the top. And then I'll call this one, I'll call it, let's call it Kana Kanji, and then click OK. OK, now that we have our table, we should be able to start writing some Japanese text into it. Let's close down the design view for the moment, and then let's expand the tables folder in the Nihongo database and make sure that our table appears. If it doesn't, you can right click on the tables folder and choose to refresh the folder and that will force the new table to appear. A fairly simple way to enter text into a table is to right click on it and then choose the option when it finally appears to edit top 200 rows. And that should mean that when this window appears, we can just type directly into it in sort of a very basic form of Excel worksheet, like the datasheet view. So let's type in a really simple word. I'm going to type in the word dog in English. The Romaji text for that will be inu, I-N-U. And then the Japanese text, if I press control and spacebar, to switch to Japanese. And then I'm going to make sure that I've got the hiragana character set selected. I should now be able to write in inu again and see the, well, both the hiragana characters, so the two characters e nu, and then also somewhere in this list should be the kanji for inu. There it is, row number six in my case. So I'll enter the kanji for that and then hit enter, and that row is stored in the database. Let's switch back to English and then type in cat, which is neko. And then on the next on the Japanese line, I'll switch back to Japanese and then type in N E K O and I get the hiragana, but if I scroll down to line three, that's the kanji character for cat. So I'll enter that and then hit enter again, and then I'll just switch back to the English language. Now it's far more common, of course, that you'll be writing code to insert these values into the table. And if we want to build up to writing a store procedure, that's what we'll need to do anyway. So let's close down the datasheet view of the table. And then I'm going to create a brand new query by either pressing Ctrl and N or clicking the new query button on the top toolbar up there. When that has appeared, I'm going to write a couple of basic bits of text. I'm going to make sure that I'm using the Nihongo database. I can see that it's already selected up here anyway, because I had an object in that database highlighted when I selected my new query button. But just to guarantee that I'm using the correct database, I'll say use Nihongo and then use the go keyword to separate this batch from the next. Then I'm going to say insert and then reference my table, which is dbo.kanakanji. It's the only one available. Now, if I weren't going to populate every single column, what I then need to do is open up some parentheses and list out the column names of that table before specifying the values. But because I'm going to populate every column, I can just shortcut this to saying values, and then in some round brackets, write out the values I want to store in those three columns. So we've got dogs and cats. Let's have let's have puppy next, and then we'll have kittens as well. So I'm going to enter the word puppy in a set of single quotes, and then the romaji for puppy is ko inu. And then if I type in a comma, I need to be very careful about the way I write this next bit of text. I need the bit of text I write now to be treated as Unicode encoded text or N char or N var char data. So I need to precede the string with a capital letter N and then open some single quotes. In fact, I'm going to close the single quotes as well and then position the cursor back inside those quotes. Then I'm going to switch into the Japanese language by pressing Windows key and spacebar. And it's I need to then make sure that I've selected the hiragana character set, so I'll choose hiragana, and then I can type in K-O-I-N-U. So again, I can see the um, hiragana string typed in, and the kanji character for that is this one here, the first one in the list, in fact. So I can highlight that and select it, and then that's entered into the text as well. I'll switch back to the English language by pressing Windows key and spacebar. And then after having inserted that value into the table, I'd also like to select all the rows from it. So I'm going to say select from dbo.kanakanji as k. And then in the select list, I'll say k.englishText. text. My IntelliSense is a bit slow. There we go. k.englishText, text, comma, k.romaji text, and then comma, k.japanese text. 
OK, so having done all of that, if I execute the query at this point, I will see that I get my new puppy inserted into the table and it's displayed with the kanji characters I've entered into my text. Now let's see what happens if we try to do the same thing without the capital letter N to indicate a Unicode encoded string. I'll just delete the letter N here and try to insert the same set of data again. We'll end up with a, an extra row of puppies, but that's no bad thing because puppies are great and we can't have too many of those. So let's execute the entire script again. And you'll see that a new puppy has been inserted, but this time the kanji character isn't represented as a kanji. It's encoded as question mark characters, just like when we saved our notepad file with the ANSI character encoding. So that capital letter N there is incredibly important, and that goes whenever you're trying to reference or insert or, or type in a Unicode encoded string in SQL. The capital letter N there makes sure it doesn't get inadvertently converted into a non-Unicode string. So as another very quick example of that, let's say we wanted to modify our select statement to find only the rows in here that were related to dogs or were related to this particular kanji for dog. I'm going to add the where clause here and say where k dot Japanese text like and then again in some single quotes preceded with a capital letter N. I'm going to switch into the Japanese language by pressing Windows key and spacebar, switch to hiragana again, and then type in I-N-U and look for the kanji character. And then I want to make sure that I find that for, um, uh, find strings that contain that kanji character. So I'm going to switch back to the English language now by pressing Windows key and spacebar. And then in front of the kanji character, I'm going to type in a percentage symbol and another one afterwards. So that's essentially saying any string which contains that kanji character. This time I'm going to just highlight the entire select statement rather than the insert in to statement again, and then click the execute button and I'll find any rows now which contain that kanji. The next step is to convert this into a basic store procedure, which accepts three values, an English word, a Romaji word and a Japanese word, and then inserts those values into the table. Just to cheat a little bit, I'm going to copy and paste this section of code from this script. I'll leave this script running because I want to use it for testing shortly. And then I'll create a brand new query and then paste in the text that I've just copied and then wrap my store procedures definition around this. So after the go keyword, I'm going to say create proc. I could say procedure, but why would I bother when I can shortcut that to proc? I'll put this in the DBO schema and I'll call it add words. And then I'll define three parameters. So I'll put these on separate lines. So on the next line, I'll put in at English, if I can spell that correctly. And that's going to be varchar up to 8,000. And then on the next line, I'll say at Romaji and that will also be varchar up to 8,000. And then on the final line, I'll say at Japanese, and that will be n varchar up to 4,000 byte pairs in length. I can then say as, and the next part is optional, but a begin end block helps you to, when you're writing multiple uh, scripts or multiple create procs in the same script, it can help you to identify the start and the end of each one. So I'm going to wrap up this text in a set of, uh, or a begin end block. Then I'm simply saying insert uh, dbo.kanakanji and the values I'm going to insert this time, not the word puppy, it's whatever is in the at English parameter. Not koinu, it's whatever is passed into the at romaji parameter. And then likewise, not this specific bit of Japanese script, it is whatever is in the at Japanese parameter. So it's a nice simple one to use this one. To create the procedure, I want to then execute the script and we should see commands completed successfully. Bear in mind if anything went wrong and you try to execute it again, you might get another failure. I can't recreate the procedure if it already exists. So to make changes to this now, you need to make the word create, the word alter. You can also say create or alter. I think that came in, is it SQL Server 2017? I think that was added. Um, if you're working prior to SQL Server 2017, you might not be able to do this particular version. But with an alter keyword, you can alter the procedure as often as you like. 
you'll find your procedure in the wonderfully named programmability folder of your database in the stored procedures folder. And eventually when it decides to update itself and show, there we go, there's my AdWords stored procedure. Now I'd like to test my procedure and to do that, I'm going to switch back to my previous script. I'm going to insert another puppy because like I say, you can't have enough of those, but rather than do this using the insert and value statement, I'm gonna take those bits away and then get rid of the round brackets at the end there as well. And then above this, I'm going to execute a store procedure. So I'm gonna say exec, or I could say execute, but I'll say exec, and then I'm going to say dbo dot, and I'd expect to find my add words procedure in my IntelliSense, but annoyingly the IntelliSense hasn't yet updated. So to force that to happen, I can press Control and Shift and R on the keyboard, or I could head up to the edit menu and choose IntelliSense and choose refresh local cache. Anyway, having done that, exec dbo.addwords should now appear and I can insert that, uh, that store procedures name. I can then optionally provide a name to the parameters that I'm passing these arguments into. I don't need to do that. As long as I'm putting them in in the right order, that's optional. So I'm gonna leave it as it is just for now and then execute this entire script and should find that I end up with yet another puppy and I can just add more and more and more puppies. <gasps> if only I could do that in the real world. Um, there we go, perfect. If I did want to name my parameters just to make this code a little more obvious, I could add the parameter names in front of each bit of text. So I could say at English, and you'll see a tooltip should pop up to, to uh, remind you of what your parameter names are. So at English, uh, and then say equals. And then I'll take this down to the next line. So after a comma, I can say at Romaji equals. And then finally, on the last line, I can say at Japanese equals. And then should we go with it? Let's have a kitten. Let's balance it out a little bit and add a kitten or two. I'm just going to take away the kanji for Inu and then hit Windows spacebar to switch to Japanese. Right click the A and choose Hiragana. And then I've got my ko uh, kanji typed in. So I'm gonna type in neko and then find the kanji for cat. So ko neko, oops, sorry, I got the wrong one there. Try that again, ko neko, there we go. Okay, I also then need to change my English text as well, of course, so let's hit Windows and Spacebar to get back to English. And I'll type in kitten and then say ko neko. I'll just take away my where clause from my test select statement then so I can return everything again. And then I can execute that script. I get a single kitten and then another kitten. I don't want too many kittens because they grow up into cats. So um, two kittens is more than enough, I think. So there we go. There's the st basic store procedure working. Now, while I'm certain that everyone is as delighted as I am about having so many puppies in our database, um, unfortunately, there is a, an extra little complication from the original question. If I just head back to the original video on which the question was asked, uh, Shin had an extra requirement that we need to compare each row that we're inserting with the existing data in the table. And then if the row already exists, then it wouldn't be inserted. Um, if the row does exist, then it gets updated. It wasn't entirely clear on which value Shin was using to, uh, to identify those unique records, how, how to determine whether something exists. Perhaps you have an ID number, a primary key value which you're using. For this particular video, I'm going to assume that the Japanese text column represents the unique columns. So that's the unique identifier. And if that Japanese text already exists, then we won't insert it again. If it does already exist, then we'll update the English text and Romaji text columns for that same row. Now, there are several different ways we could do this. Um, you could write the basic logic using an if statement to check if a row exists in a table and then take the appropriate action. But there's actually a, a, a technique already built into SQL Server which allows you to do this uh, using the merge statement. So what I'm going to do is go back to the definition of my store procedure, making sure it at least says alter and perhaps create or alter if you're lucky enough to have a version which supports it. And then I'm going to take the insert statement all the way down to the bottom. That's the last thing that might happen. 
within the begin end block, I'm going to type in the word merge. And the first thing you do in the merge statement is you uh, specify the target table. So, so we specify where the data is going to end up. So specify target table. And then on the next line, I'll just refer to dbo dot canna kanji. So that's the table I'm getting my data into. I'll also give that an alias. I'll say as t. What we then do is refer to the data we're trying to insert into that table using the using statement. So here, this is the uh, the source data, I suppose you wanted to call it that. Source data or source table. Now, we're not using a source table, of course. We're just using the values of some parameters. So to make this work, what we're going to do is generate a subquery. So on the below the using row in a set of round brackets, I'm going to say select. And then on the next line, I'm going to say at English. And I'm going to give that an alias as English text. So I'm going to match the column names of my target table, although that's not compulsory. And then a comma and say at Romaji as Romaji text. And then at, sorry, comma at Japanese as Japanese text. Then I can close the round brackets and then assign an alias to that subquery to say as S. The next thing I have to do is say which columns in the source and the target I'm trying to find a match for. What, what's the unique identifier that, that, that indicates that this row already exists? And we do this using an on clause, a lot like you would in a join if you were writing joins in SQL. So I'm going to say on t dot Japanese text. My IntelliSense is a little bit broken at this point, but t dot Japanese text equals s dot Japanese text. Okay, so having done that, let me just scroll down a little bit so we can see a little more clearly. We then have to say what we want to do when a match has been made and when a match hasn't been made. And we do that using kind of like a specialized case expression. So after the on clause, we can say, when matched then. If I can spell matched correctly, that will help an awful lot. So when matched then, I want to perform an update statement. I'll say update set. And I want to set the values of two columns. I want to set the target tables English text. So t dot English text. I'm having trouble spelling that today. Apologies. I'll get there eventually. T dot English text equals S dot English text. And then I also want to set T dot Romaji text equals S dot Romaji text. Finally, I can say what to do when this is not matched. So I can say when not matched, then I want to perform my insert statement. So I can say insert, but I need to modify the way this works now. So I, I don't want to refer to my um, my kanji table. What I want to do is refer to the column names in my target table. So I want to say in a set of round brackets, English text, comma, Romaji text, comma, Japanese text. Okay. And one final requirement, there's a little red squiggly left lingering around at the end there. If you hover the mouse cursor over that, it'll tell you that this is one of the rare statements in TSQL that requires a semicolon statement terminator. So if I stick the semicolon in there, that will make sure that the statement is valid. And having done all of that, I can execute the script to update my store procedure using a merge statement. Okay, so now that we've made such drastic changes, we should definitely test this. And I'll go back to my test script for that. So I want to tidy up a little bit first. So before we try to add any more data to that table, I'd like to truncate the table to get rid of any data in there whatsoever. So I'm going to write a truncate table statement above, and I'm going to refer to my kana kanji table. So dbo dot kana kanji. I'll then write the go batch separator just below that. And I'm just I'm just going to execute that statement by itself to begin with. So I'll execute that. And then if I highlight and execute my select statement, you should see that that table is now empty. 
I'm now just going to comment out the truncate table statement. So I'll select both lines and then add the add, click the add comment button or comment block button. And then I'm going to execute the entire query and I'll find that a single kitten gets added. Apparently a dog outside has noticed the kitten and is barking away. Apologies if you can hear that. Um, so <laughs> now that I've added a single kitten, let's try to add another kitten. Let's execute that. But oh no, no more kittens appear. We can only have a single kitten. So um, I'm going to change this. Let's try to add a puppy. Puppies um, are better than cats, although they do grow up into noisy dogs. Again, apologies if you can hear this dog barking away in the background. Um, puppy ko inu, and then I'm going to modify the Japanese kanji there. So I'll take away the symbol for a cat, press Windows and Spacebar on my keyboard to get to Japanese, and then type in inu, and then, oh, I forgot to change to the Hiragana character set. That's why that didn't work. So I can right click on A, choose Hiragana, and then type in Inu and select the symbol for a dog. Okay, so having updated that, I can execute the script again and I'll find that a puppy does get inserted, hooray. But sadly, if I click execute again, no more puppies get inserted. Uh, so we can cheat. Um, I'm going to change the text in there I'm going to press, uh, I'm going to go back to the Hiragana text. I'm going to right click and then go back to Hiragana. And then I'm going to say ko inu, but then leave that as the, um, the Hiragana. So I can select it from a list or just leave it in there as it is. So having done that, if I now execute the query again, because the Hiragana is different to the kanji, I do get to insert a puppy again. Hooray! Okay, so at this point, I think we're ready to move into Excel. I've started with a blank workbook and then just typed in a few basic values. So some column headings and a bit of basic formatting and then some English and Romaji text. What I really want to check is that I can type in Japanese characters into the worksheet itself. So I'm going to right click on my letter A there and choose Hiragana. And then next to the Romaji for Inu, I'll type in I-N-U and that gets converted into the Hiragana text. I can select the kanji if I like from the list in the usual way, just as I did in SQL Server. And I can do exactly the same thing then for Neko and then select the kanji for that as well. So that all looks as though it's working properly. Now let's see what happens if we try to do the same thing in VBA. I'd like to try to place another dog in the active cell. I'll start by switching back to English language input first and then open up the Visual Basic Editor with Alt and F11. Then I can insert a new module into my project and choose to create a new subroutine. I'll call it Test Japanese. In here, I'd like to refer to the active cell and then try to change its value property to be equal to a string. So I'll open and close some double quotes and then position the mouse cursor or the text cursor back inside those quotes. Now I'll switch back to the Japanese language input and make sure that I have the Hiragana character set selected. And then inside those quotes, I'm going to type in Inu again. So you can see I do get a pop-up with the IME. It's a slightly different style. I get it in the top left-hand corner, but I can still select the Inu kanji from that list. However, when I do that, you'll see that I get a question mark written into the Visual Basic Editor. Hmm, I wonder where we've seen that before in this video. Um, if I then run the subroutine and have a look at what I get in the active cell, again, that is a question mark. And the reason for this, we saw the exact same thing when we saved our notepad file in an ANSI enco encoding, and when we omitted the capital letter N in front of our Unicode string in the SQL Server. Sadly, the Visual Basic Editor doesn't support Unicode text. The same would be true if we try to read a Unicode character. If I select cell C2 and then head back to the Visual Basic Editor, I'll switch back to English language input and then I'll comment out the line I've just written. Let's say debug.print active cell.value. So I can try to display that in the immediate window down below. If I run the subroutine, I get a question mark. If I try to replace debug.print with message box instead, when I run that subroutine, yet again, I get a question mark. So basically you can't use Unicode characters in the same way in the Visual Basic Editor. Now, although we can't type Unicode characters directly into the Visual Basic Editor, we can still manipulate Unicode encoded strings with the help of a couple of functions. 
The first function I'm going to use is a variation of the ASC or ask function, which allows you to return the character code of a, of a single character. There's a variation of that function called ASCW, I believe the W stands for wide, that returns the Unicode character code. Now, just a little word of warning, the, the, the meaning of the word Unicode here in the Microsoft documentation appears to mean the UCS2 um, encoding of Unicode. So it appears to only allow the 65,536 characters that you can see in the UCS2 encoding. So um, I'm not sure this supports absolutely every possible Unicode character, but it's better than nothing, I suppose. So to make use of that, what I'm going to do is change message box back to debug.print, and then I'm going to wrap the ASCW function around the value of the active cell. And then just making sure that I have my cell selected, my correct cell selected, cell C2, I can then run that subroutine, and it prints out the numbers 29356. So making use of that now, what I'm going to do is comment out the debug.print statement and then uncomment the active cell value. And now I'm going to make use of a function called chrw or char or character w. So again, it's a variation of the original chr function. So you can pass the character code to this function and that will write out the character which corresponds to that code. And again, it seems to um, only support up to the 65,535 characters um, defined in the UCS2 encoding. So this might not support absolutely everything, but let's give it a whirl. If I switch back to the Visual Basic Editor, I'm going to change the active cells value to CHRW and then 29356 close the parentheses, make sure I've got the correct cell selected, which is cell C4, and then run that subroutine. And when I look back at the Visual Basic Editor, hooray, I've actually written a Unicode character using VBA code. You can also use this function in conjunction with the Unicode character charts on unicode.org. So if I switch back to that website and I find my CJK uh, section there and click on that link, it opens up the character chart for these characters. So down the left hand side is the hexadecimal code for those characters. So I can pick any one at random in principle, it doesn't really matter which one. Let's go for, uh, let's go for this one, 4E1F. I, I'm afraid I have absolutely no idea what that kanji represents, but that's the code I'm going to use, 4E1F. Now to enter that as a hexadecimal code in VBA, what I have to do, I can't just type in the number directly, I can't just type in 4E1F, I have to indicate that the, the value I'm passing in here is hexadecimal code. So I do that by saying ampersand H in front of the number. So having done that, if I run that subroutine again and have a look back at Excel, I can see that the kanji character that's been printed out there should correspond to the one with that character code in the, uh, the character chart on the Unicode website. It's also possible to get Unicode characters to appear on a type of message box, obviously not on the Visual Basic message box, we've just seen that that doesn't work, but we can use a Windows script pop-up to make Unicode characters appear in a message. So to do that, we'd need to create an object first. So I'm going to use the create object function, and then in some round brackets and some double quotes, refer to wscript.shell. And then I'm going to use the pop-up method of that Windows script object, and then pass into the pop-up the value of the active cell. So I'll just say active cell dot value. So that's the, the equivalent of the prompt parameter of the message box function in VBA. I can also set a title if I type in two commas, and then I can set a title, uh, some Unicode text, something along those lines. And then if I just comment out the active cell value, and then just make sure which cell I've got selected. So it's one which does indeed have a Unicode kanji character shown in it. And then if I run this subroutine, we'll see a message pop up, some Unicode text, and that kanji character displayed. So that's some basic background information about using Unicode characters in the VB editor. Let's get on to the important stuff next. I want to be able to communicate with the SQL Server database we created earlier, send data to it, and retrieve data from it. 
In order to do that, we're going to use ActiveX data objects. So the first thing I'll do is head to the tools menu and choose references. And then in the list, I'll scroll down to find the Microsoft ActiveX data objects libraries. The one I'm going to go for is the latest version I have available, which should be 6.1 if you're working in Windows 10. So I'll check the box next to that. And then having done that, I'll click OK and begin a new subroutine. This first one is going to get data from SQL Server. And in order to do that, I'm going to do this in the same way that I demonstrated in the video that this question was asked on. So I'm going to declare a variable that will hold a reference to an ADODB connection. So dim cn as connection. I'll then declare another variable called cmd, short for command, as an ADODB, ADODB.command. And then I'll also declare a variable that can hold a reference to a record set object. So dim rs as adodb.record set. Next, I'm going to set up the connection string to communicate with that particular database. So I'm going to say set cm equals new adodb connection to create a new instance of that class. And then I'm going to set the connection string property. So I'll say cn.connection string equals. Now we've gone into details about connection strings a lot in this sequence of videos that this question has been asked on. So I'm not going to explain too much right now. What I am going to do is say that you do need to make sure that you've got the particular provider that I'm going to use installed if you want to do this in exactly the same way that I am. So I'm going to use the MS Olay DB SQL provider. So in order to make that work, what you'll need to make sure of is that you have that driver installed. So there we go, the Microsoft Olay DB driver for SQL Server. Um, I'm not sure which version I have installed at the moment. I can't remember the last time I updated it, but it's sufficient to communicate with SQL Server 2017 anyway. Um, it's worthwhile mentioning that they added UTF-8 support for this particular driver um, in a particular version of the driver, just so if you're working in SQL Server 2019 and using UTF-8 encoded Unicode strings, then you might want to make sure you've got an up-to-date version of that driver. Anyway, back to my code. So my provider is MS OLADB SQL and then a semicolon. And then I'm just going to break this across a few different lines to make it easier to read. The next thing is the server. And that's my on my local host. So I'll say server equals local host and then a backslash SQL 2017, which is the name of the instance of SQL Server that I'm using. And then I can use another ampersand to join together a new line below that. The database I'm going to connect to, that's nice and easy. That's the one we created earlier on. That's called Nihongo. And then another semicolon, and I'll concatenate another new line to the end of that. And the last thing I'll say here is trusted connection. And I'll set that property to equals ES as well. I can then type in a semicolon to end that, close the double quotes, and then just as a very quick sense check to make sure that my connection is actually working, I'm going to say cn.open, provide a few blank lines where I'll fill in some extra code shortly, and then say cn.close. So at that point, if I just run that subroutine, as long as nothing goes wrong, it's all working. So I've communicated with the database, opened my connection and closed it down again. Next, I'm going to create a new command object by saying set cmd equals new adodb.command. And I'll set a few properties of that command. I'll say cmd.activeConnection, first of all. That's going to be the only connection I have available. That's cn. Then I'll say cm.commandType, and that's simply going to be ad command text. And the command text itself is going to be nice and short and sweet, cmd.commandText. I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit. I wouldn't do this normally in a production environment, but just for convenience here, I'm going to say select asterisk, select all, all columns from the table we created earlier, dbo.kana kanji. What I now want to do is execute that command and return the record set that it produces into my record set variable. So to do that, I can say set rs equals cmd.execute. And if I just open some parentheses temporarily, you can see that the command execute method returns a reference as a record set. Now that I have that record set, I want to write out its contents somewhere into a new worksheet. 
I'm not going to bother with the column headings. Again, the video that this question was asked on has details about how to get the column headings as well. So just for simplicity, what I'm going to do is say worksheets.add.range a one dot copy from record set and then I'm simply going to refer to my record set object rs. Having done that I'm going to say rs.close and at the moment I clearly have just one single worksheet in this workbook. If I now execute this subroutine I will end up with two worksheets and what I should end up with on that new worksheet is a list of all the contents of my uh, kanji kana table or kana kanji table that we saw earlier on that we were adding our puppies and kittens into. Next I'd like to write a subroutine which executes our store procedure to either insert or update just one single row of data into our SQL Server table. So I'm going to pick one of the rows that I've written out here on sheet one. Let me just get rid of this extra kanji, either a dog or a cat, it doesn't really matter. I'll go for, I'll go for cell A2 or row two in my worksheet, dog, inu, and then the kanji for inu. So to make that work, a lot of the code we're going to use is pretty much the same as the one we used to get data from SQL Server. So as a bit of a cheat, I'm going to copy that entire subroutine and then paste it in just below. And then I'm just going to change the name of this to say uh, insert or update one row. Okay, so the connection and the command will be the same. We don't need a record set this time, so I'm going to remove that variable entire, entirely. I still need a connection object and the connection string will be the same. I need to open the connection and I do need a new command. I am going to use the same connection, of course, but this time the command type will be different. I don't want to use command text. I want to use a command stored procedure. So I'm going to choose ad cmd stored proc. By the way, I've just pressed control and spacebar there to get my IntelliSense list to reappear. So ad command stored proc. Now the command text this time is simply going to be the name of the stored procedure. So the name of the stored procedure we created earlier on was called add words. So that's the one we're going to use here as well. So we can change that to say add words. Now the next thing we're going to do is make sure that we get a list of parameters defined in that store procedure. So I'm going to add a couple of extra lines here to do with the command. I'm going to say cmd.parameters.refresh. And then I'm also going to make sure that we're using named parameters. So cmd.named parameters equals true. What I'm then going to do is refer to the individual parameter names that we defined. So again, if you remember those, they were at English, at Romaji, at Japanese. And I'm going to do that by saying cmd.parameters. And then in some round brackets and some double quotes, I can say at English. And then I can say the value of that parameter is equal to the value of a cell on the worksheet. So remember, I'm referring to range A2, so I'm going to say range A2 dot value. Then I can simply copy and paste that line a couple of times and then just update my parameter names. So I can say Romaji and then Japanese and then refer to range B2 and range C2 to pass in the appropriate values. I don't need to use my record set here. In fact, I don't have my record set anymore, so I can't use my record set. So I'm going to take away the set RS equals part of that statement, but I still need to execute my command. So I've executed that, and then I'm just going to get rid of the two other lines which reference my record set variable, and making sure that I am on the correct worksheet. I've got range A2 with dog available there. If I execute that subroutine now, and then I switch back to SQL Server Management Studio, and I highlight the code which selects everything from my Kana Kanji table, when I execute that, I should now have a dog there as well. Okay, so at this point, we're almost there. All we need to do now is make that store procedure execute itself for each row of data that we want to either insert or update in the Excel worksheet. So I'm just going to rearrange things a little bit here. I'm going to assume that sheet one contains my main list that controls whether things are inserted or updated. And I'm just going to head back to sheet two there. I'm going to put these two lists together. I want my kittens and puppies all in the same sheet. So I'm just going to copy those 
and then place those onto sheet one at the bottom of the list. And then I can get rid of sheet two entirely. I don't need that anymore for the moment. Okay, so the code to get this to work for each row simply involves looping through this list of values. So we're going to start in cell A2 and we're going to loop through all the cells down to the end of the list. So back into the Visual Basic Editor. I think again, a quick cheat here. We can copy the entire subroutine that we've just finished writing, paste that in down below, and then change its name to say insert or update all rows. We'll need an extra variable to loop through our range collection. So I'm going to say dim r as range. And then at the position where we are starting to set the values of parameters and execute our command, this section of code here, I need to execute this for each individual row in our table. So I'm just going to highlight all those lines and then indent those one space. Everything else in the entire subroutine needs to happen once and once only. This little section needs to be repeated. And it's going to repeat for each R in. And I want to refer to a range of cells, so I can do this in a few different ways. I'm going to make sure that I don't have to be on the correct worksheet when I reference these cells. So I'm going to rely on the code name of my worksheet called sheet1. So I'm going to say sheet1 dot range a Two. So that represents the very first cell in column A that contains a row I want to insert or update. I can then type in a comma, and now I'd like to reference the cell which sits at the bottom of this list. Now there are several different ways to do this. This has cropped up on a few videos recently actually, so it's worthwhile probably going into a bit of detail here. Um, imagine, if you will, if I just temporarily delete all the rows except for one in my list. If I refer to cell A2, and then use the end property to refer down to the end of the list. That means that it's going to effectively simulate pressing the control key and the shift key and the down arrow key on the keyboard, meaning it highlights everything all the way down to the bottom of the worksheet. And I don't want to do that. If I have multiple items in my list and I have cell A2 selected, hold down control and shift and tap the down arrow key, then that stops at the bottom of the list. So it's because there was no data there below cell A2 that this example failed, or did the wrong thing, I should say. So what I'm going to do to avoid that, regardless of how many rows of data I have in my list, I'm going to go from the very bottom of the worksheet in column A, end Excel up, and that will always stop at the last row of my table, even if it only contains one single row. Of course, that relies on there being nothing below your table in the list, so it might not be entirely appropriate in all cases, but that's the approach I'm going to take. So back into the Visual Basic Editor, I can then say sheet one dot range a 1,048,576 dot end Excel up and close two sets of round brackets. And then I can close my loop after I've executed the command by saying next R. Finally, what I need to do is update the cell's values that I'm referring to. So it's not always range A2 that I'm interested in here. I want to refer to the value of R for the English parameter. And then for the Romaji parameter, that's R.offset 0,1.value. So the value of the cell, one column to the right of the cell referred to by this variable. I can just copy and paste that bit of code there so that the Japanese parameter gets its value from the cell that's offset two columns to the right from the cell referenced by the R variable. So there we go, that's the entire procedure written. Okay, just before we test this, I'd like to tidy up my SQL Server table to make sure it's completely empty to begin with. So I'm going to head back to SQL Server and my test script. I'm just going to uncomment my truncate table statement and then execute that. And then if I highlight and execute my select statement, we should see that that table is now completely empty. If I now switch back to Visual Basic or the VB editor, I can run this subroutine. And for each row in that table, it's executed that store procedure. If I now switch back to SQL Server and run the code to select everything from that table, it's now full of all the values I've inserted in the Excel list. Now, I, it, this is still controlled by the merge statement, of course. Our store procedures definition hasn't changed. So if I switch back to Excel and then run this subroutine again, 
it still processes the same list of cells. But if I head back to SQL Server Management Studio and run my query, it still only contains those initial five rows. I could happily add more rows in if I go back to my Excel worksheet and let's type in a couple of other things. I'll type in uh, Nihon, uh, sorry, beg pardon, that should be Japan in the English text and Nihon in the Romaji text. I'll switch into the Japanese editor and then choose hiragana and type in Nihon there and select the kanji for that. And I'll also, switching back to English, type in the UK and then go for Ikirisu and then switch back to Japanese and this time I'll switch into katakana, full width katakana and then type in the same thing, Ikirisu and then select that from the list. So a couple of new things inserted. I'd also like to update some things, just change some casings of some things perhaps. Let's um, switch back to the English language input and I'll just maybe capitalize uh, the C of cat and the D of dog perhaps, just to demonstrate that this does indeed update values when they do exist. So I'll go for Inu and Neko with a capital N. And then having done all of that, I'll switch back to the Visual Basic Editor. I will run this subroutine. It loops through all the same cells, including those extra two rows. And when I switch back to SQL Server Management Studio and run this select statement again, all those changes have been updated in the SQL Server table as well. So phew, there we go, that's the entire system working. It could do with a bit of tidying up, I appreciate. It could do with a nice user interface, maybe some buttons to click on, etc., etc. But I'm sure that Shin is more than capable of doing that part themselves. Um, I'm pretty sure that I've answered the question in, in probably too comprehensive a way. I'm sure a lot of that information Shin already knew, but some of it was new to me. So I've learned a few things by doing that. And I'm, I'm quite enjoying this. Uh, so thanks for the question. I, I hope it answers the question. Um, feel free to ask more. I can't promise another video response like this one, but I'll happily get back to you if you have more questions about it. So thanks for watching. See you next time.